everyone. Thanks so much for checking out this resource from Lakewood Baptist Church in Gainesville, Georgia. This is our weekday Bible study and we're in the middle of a series on what is the gospel. Uh, if you haven't caught the last few studies, you can find those online. Go back and check it out on our website and find all the studies in this series. Today's lesson is going to be from our associate pastor, Don Ormsby. Look forward to hearing what he has to say and, of course, look forward to seeing you all soon. God bless. Hey everyone, Don Ormsby, Associate Pastor of Lakewood Baptist Church, and I'm so delighted to have the opportunity from Dr. Tyler to be able to share in our Tuesday Bible study. Uh, as we look at the question, what is the gospel? Now before we get to our text from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I thought it would be nice just to give you a little bit of historical background about the city of Thessalonica. The city of Thessalonica was visited by Paul on his second missionary journey. Last October, we were actually in Greece with a group from here at Lakewood, and we were in the city of Thessalonica, which is now the modern day city of Thessaloniki. What was kind of surprising was that there are very few archaeological sites dating to the first century here in this modern day city. This is one of those sites. It is a Roman market, but you'll notice that it's completely surrounded by the city. Now, in the time of Paul, however, Thessalonica would have been the largest city in Macedonia, and it would have had a very fine port and harbor there on the Aegean Sea. You see, it's a very beautiful, beautiful place. Thessalonica was a Greek city, but it had a large number of Roman and Jewish inhabitants. It, in fact, had a well-established synagogue, and that is where Paul goes to preach the gospel. He goes to the synagogue for two reasons. First, in the synagogue, there would have been a ready-made congregation. And secondly, in the synagogue, there would have been copies of, of the scripture on large scrolls. And Paul could take those scrolls, he could read those scrolls, and he could teach from those scrolls about who Jesus was. The synagogue in Thessalonica, like many others, would have had a large population or main body of Jews, but it also would have been augmented by a number of God-fearing Gentiles, both men and women, who would have been attracted to Judaism because of its monotheism and also its high morality. Now, the story of Paul is found in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. This is where we find recorded of Paul's visit to the city of Thessalonica. We have there, what we read there, is there were some Jews and also some Greek women who are converted in Thessalonica and a church is established. But Paul, however, has to quickly move from Thessalonica. You see, there was a group of devout Jews who were opposed, opposed Paul there and because of that, because of his fear and because of his concern for perhaps his own safety and also for the care and concern of these new converts, he moves on to Berea. Now, we actually were in Berea as well on our trip to Greece. And what you see here is the actual steps that Paul would have preached the gospel from there as a part of the synagogue. Paul would have preached from these very, very steps. But Paul is not in Berea very long when the same devout Jews that opposed him in Thessalonica follow him over to Berea. And it's impossible for him to stay there in Berea. And so he moves on again down to Athens and Corinth. So Paul moves from this area up here in the northern part of Greece. You'll see Thessalonica and Berea. And he moves southward all the way down again to Athens and Corinth. As Paul is forced to leave, though, Paul is generally concerned about the well-being of these converts, these new believers in Christ there in Thessalonica. And so he actually sends or he leaves behind Timothy and Silas to check and to see how they're doing in this hostile environment of Thessalonica. Timothy brings back good news about the growth of their faith, and he pins his first letter, his first epistle in response to this news. Now, this is very interesting because as you look at our English Bible, we'll know that we find 1 Thessalonians in about the middle of, uh, of, our, of our English Bible. But really, uh, it was the first 
of those letters. So many times when we see the, the Pauline letters listed in a list, we'll see that 1 Thessalonians is listed first. Although in our Bibles today, it comes about again halfway in the middle uh, of the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says this, Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Paul thanks God constantly for them in prayer. Paul finds much in the report from Timothy about the Thessalonian church to be thankful for. So let me go ahead and just read these first 10 verses of this chapter. It's just, the chapter itself is just 10 verses, so let me just read these for you, and then we'll look at how these, this passage of Scripture relates to the question, what is the gospel? Starting there in verse 2, we see this. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of, of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what the king of reception, or they, about the report, what the kind of reception you gave us, they tell how you turn God from idols to serve the living true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he praised, raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. What is the gospel? Well, for many of you watching this today, you may think that may be an easy question. But if I were to ask you, what is the gospel, and you were to send me in all your answers, I know that we would have a variety of different responses based upon your personal experience and your interpretation of the scripture. So before we even get started today to look at this passage, I thought it'd be good for you to know what, know what I consider to be the gospel that I believe was preached by Paul, that was preached by the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Although we call them the Gospels, just remember there is only one Gospel, but also the Gospel that was preached by Jesus. When I use the word Gospel, I believe it is referring to the good news. The Greek word is euangelion, which is translated Gospel, but what it really means is good news. What is the good news? Well, in, in the words of the gospel, or the, the, the words uh, can be defined for us in three words. Jesus is Lord. Or perhaps even better, Jesus is King. Now, I've come to believe that we do not confess Jesus as Lord in order to acquire something from Jesus and then casually move on with our lives. As one of my theological professors, Dr. Gally, Gally, Gary Galliotti, said in college, he used to say that declaring that Jesus is Lord is so much more than guaranteeing our fire insurance and having our tickets to the worlds of fun. Jesus is our leader. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our King, both here and now. God's kingdom has come through King Jesus. The story of Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Israel's story. Look what the scripture says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says this. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. 
And so through him, the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. King Jesus rules over all nations as Israel's Messiah and the world's true Lord. This is big news. This is, this is good news that through Jesus, he gives life. Life that, that we can experience right now and life that we will experience one day when we die. Through Christ, God is restoring all things. Now, before you wonder, well, what about salvation? Isn't that really what the gospel is? Well, I believe that salvation certainly is a part of the gospel. But I would agree with Dallas Willard when he is speaking of the, about the gospel and he says this. He says, a view of salvation and grace that has no connection with discipleship and spiritual transformation is a view of grace and salvation that supposedly gets one ready to die, but leaves them unprepared to live now in the grace and the power of the resurrection. A well-respected American theologian, Michael, or Australian theologian, Michael Byrd has said this. He said, the gospel is the announcement that God's kingdom has come in life and death and resurrection of Jesus of, Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord and Messiah, in fulfillment of Israel's scripture, the gospel evokes faith, repentance, and discipleship, and its accompanying effects include salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's kingdom has come through King Jesus. Paraphrasing from an article I was reading this week, the writer of that article said this, Jesus is the center of the gospel. His life, his death, his resurrection, the whole story of the Bible, the whole story of Jesus is that God has rescued the world from chaos and decay and invited all human beings everywhere to look at Jesus, the central character of the story, and that in him and through him, the way in which the new world has come to pass, and then we can also participate in that new world. My friend and mentor, Bill from Buckeye, says that, that you can define the gospel in just 30 words. God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is with us. Come to show us his love, to save us from our sin, to set up his kingdom so we can share his life. That is the gospel. Again, God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, He is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. He has come to show us His love, to save us from sin, to set up His kingdom so that we can share in His life. So now we kind of have that out of the way and we have a better understanding about what the gospel is, or at least as I see the gospel defined. Let's look at this text from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's look and begin now today with verse 4. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Paul says that the outcome of receiving the gospel, which is good news, that King Jesus comes not only through the work, or through the power, but also through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, which leads us through Christ to our justification, our reconciliation, and our invitation to be a part of God's new world, his kingdom, which has already begun. The Bible tells us that we are called to be his ambassadors. An ambassador is a representative of the king. As ambassadors is in, his, in his kingdom, we are to take the message of the king. We are to imitate Christ. We are to imitate God to the entire world. The Thessalonians understood that the gospel is life. It, had, it, it wasn't just a decision that they made at a revival meeting or at an invitation of Paul. It wasn't just a set of beliefs or, or a set of doctrines. It was about how they lived. 
If you look at verse 2 again, it says in verse 2, we remember before God and our Father your work. When it says your work there, it's talking about how they lived, how they lived before they came to Christ and how they lived after they came to Christ. And that, that work was produced, it says here, by faith. Your labor prompted by love and your endurance is inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, and love. It, it seems like I've heard Paul use those words somewhere else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, Now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. You see, Paul expected that their faith would work, that their faith would make a difference in the way that they lived. Their love uh, would labor and their hope would endure. These were and are the signs of someone who has received the gospel, the new life in the new kingdom where Christ is King and Lord. You see, faith without love, there is no integrity. Faith without hope loses its direction, and love without faith slips into sloppy sentimentality. All three should be present and productive in the life of a Christian believer. Here in Thessalonica, Paul is impressed by the active Christian living of these, these Thessalonians. And again, he gives God continual thanks for them. In his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul speaks about this transformation that comes from having received the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 1, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, Paul says this, Therefore be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as proper among the saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Verse 7, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live or walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth trying to find what is pleasing to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul could have very easily have said, be imitators of Christ, just like the believers in Thessalon Thess Thessalonica. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Be imitators of Christ, just like the believers in Thessalonica. Be imitator of Christ's love. We imitate, imitate Christ in the world by loving as Christ loved and living like Christ lived. Paul is simply elaborating on, on the words of Jesus when he was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus responded in this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. The result of the gospel is to love God and to love people because that's who God is. God is love. Love that we are to imitate. It is what the followers of Christ were imitating in Thessalonica. Look at verse 4. For we know, brothers and sisters, that we are loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators. There's that word again of us and for all the Lord for you are welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit the gospel 
the gospel of Jesus Christ here in verse four and six, Paul reminds them that they were chosen. He is confident that they were chosen because he sees the evidence of the gospel in their daily living. The scripture says, even in the midst of suffering, they welcomed the message of the gospel with joy. Not, don't want to oversimplify this, but where does joy come from? Well, this passage says it comes from the Holy Spirit. But do you remember back to when we were looking earlier in our Wisdom 2020 study and we were looking at the Sermon on the Mount? We looked at the Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the merciful. That word blessed there actually can be interpreted either happy or to be joyful. Joyful are the merciful. Joyful are the pure in heart. Joyful are the peacemakers. Joyful are those who have been persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is how we are to live. The lives of the Thessalonians have, been, have become so completely transformed as they received the gospel. The gospel is transformational. Again, the gospel, the scripture says that it came to them in words, but not simply words. The gospel came to them not just in words, but in power. Words are essential, but they're not always sufficient. Think about that for a moment. They heard the gospel. Many people hear the gospel, but they cannot respond unless the gospel came to them in power. The simple words of the gospel came with power to their hearts, to their ears, to their eyes, to their minds. They were transformed by the gospel. Jesus became their king and Lord, and it totally changed who they were. They were now included in the divine life of a triune God. It came to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. The good news but it was not only uh, did it come as divine in the, in the Holy Spirit, it came to them with deep conviction. They had a great passion, believing that this truly was the word of God. It was the gospel for life, for the present and also for the future. The result of this understanding is outlined in the last four verses of this chapter. Verse Verses 7 through uh, 10 says, So you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from not only you in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living God living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven when he raised from the dead Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. They, these Thessalonians, were examples of living the Christian life, and they were example of being the Christian church there in Thessalonica. The gospel came in power, and they were changed. They became imitators of Christ, they changed and became example for others to follow. Isn't that the question we probably need to ask ourselves? Is how has the power of the gospel changed our lives? In this process of dynamic change, of becoming imitators and then becoming examples for others to follow, is this the process that we see in our own lives? Is this the process that we see in the church? How do we respond? How do we respond when the waiter or waitress at the restaurant we're eating at it, and eventually we are going to be back eating at restaurants, but how do we respond when the waiter or the waitress at the restaurant we're eating at just doesn't give us very good service or perhaps is even rude to us? How do we respond when that person cuts us off going down the highway? How do we respond when a friend or a family member or even an enemy offends us? Do we imitate Christ? Do we imitate Christ in word, in deed, and in love? You see, the Thessalonians were not just believers in Christ. 
Verses 8 through 10, again, reminds us that, the, that their, the message of the Thessalonians, what they believed in, their example spread throughout the entire Greek world. Paul says they did not need to tell people about the work in Thessalonica because everyone was talking about it. It would have been all over social media. There was such a transformation in the lives of these people that people were gossiping about it constantly. They came to be witnesses, not just believers. You see, there was no gap between their worship and their witness. There was no gap between their creed and their conduct. So people noticed. People noticed and spoke about the transformation, their transformation from idol worship to worshiping the true and living God. Paul is writing this letter from Corinth, and I'm sure that he has been hearing already about the things that are happening in Thessalonica, their consistency in holy living and their authenticity rang out across the nations. They were small in number. They lived in a hostile environment, but they had a major impact on the Greek world for the sake of the gospel. The Thessalonians were imitators of Christ, having received the gospel. The scripture says, again, that they loved as Christ loved, and they lived as Christ lived, and with the anticipation that their king, who they already were serving, was coming back again. That is what the gospel looked like for the Thessalonians. So what does the gospel look like for you? What, what is the gospel? For the Thessalonians, it was the realization that Christ brings life. He is king. The gospel brings life. The cross is the decisive victory over Satan, sin, and death. The cross and resurrection of Christ is the climactic revelation of who God is. He is self-giving. He is radically forgiving. And he is co-suffering love. A love that descends all the way into our deepest and darkest fears and illusions. For Paul and the Thessalonians, the gospel was the transformational life found in the person of King Jesus. Let's pray together. Eternal God and Father, Son and Holy Spirit, You've created heaven and earth, and by you all things were created. Even in the midst of a global pandemic, I know and believe you are in charge. You are the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our King. May our lives reflect that in our daily living as a part of your kingdom now, and in the kingdom life to come. Amen and amen. So good to be with you. Look forward to seeing you very, very soon.